Well, hey, good morning, church. Good morning. I'm glad you guys are here this morning. Um, if you're with us for the first time, my name's Todd. I'm senior minister here. We're glad that you all are here this morning. And uh, for those who are joining us online, we're glad that you're with us as well. Um, hey, we're getting ready to start a new sermon series this week. So we're going to be kicking things off here in just a second. But before we do that, I, I just want to remind you guys, and I do this from time to time, um, whether you're using the bulletin or you're using the Version app, if you're using that app, you can go to the events page and you can find Milford Christian Church. All of the, uh, the sermon notes and everything are on there. Um, but find one thing. What is your one thing? And, and I, I do this so that every week you guys can take something away that maybe God's showing you as we go through this, this time together, something that you can share together as a family, maybe later today or as the week goes on, but just something that you'll be able to take away, ponder, think about, pray to God about, and, and let that be the thing that, that God is going to be leading you with this entire week. Um, like I said, we're going to be starting a new sermon series, and I want to start this one with a question that we ask from time to time. Um, so I hope you never get tired of, of hearing this question because it's very important. And that question is, why are we here? Why are we here? Now, not, not necessarily in like this big metaphysical sense. I mean, that's one thing to talk about. But, but why are we here? Why does this church exist? Um, one of my, my minister friends likes to say, you know, if you lose your why, you lose your way. And that's kind of a, a, a neat way to put it because as a church, we've got to constantly be coming back to the fact that why were we created? Why does God have us doing what we're supposed to be doing? Are we doing what we're supposed to be doing? And so as we start this new series this morning, I want to take a look at what is the main thing that the church exists to do in the world. There's so much that goes on in conjunction with that, uh, but where should our focus be? Now, if you've been with us over the past couple of weeks, we, we took a long time. We took seven weeks and we looked at the I Am statements of Jesus through the, the Gospel of John, how, how Jesus connects himself with the Father and connects himself with the way that the kingdom is coming into the earth and how this changes everything. In the past two weeks, we talked about doubt, and what's it like to doubt whether or not these events really happened, or maybe even the doubt that we have on ourselves, like, God, can you really use me? And, and so it's important as we go into this next step to really focus in on what this next part of this conversation is going to be about, because what we're going to be talking about is the word disciple, and we're going to, we're going to go in depth about that word, and, and what does it mean to be a disciple? And so for the next five weeks, we're going to center in on, on what that is about in regards to obeying Jesus' commission, his command at the end of Matthew 28. So if you open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 28, we're going to find out what is it that the church exists to do, not just Milford Christian Church, but the church at large. What are the last things that Jesus says to his disciples? And I want to get kind of the context for this because you're going to see that maybe some of these guys are dealing with the same things that we're dealing with as Jesus commissions them. In Matthew 28, we read these words, starting in verse 16. It says, So the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain that Jesus had designated. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. It's interesting. The eleven are still there, and some are doubting. Then Jesus came up and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Now, you might notice that on the screen, we've got a big chunk of that in yellow. This is going to be our next memory verse. Yay! Now, I'll, I'll tell you, we started out as a church, we started out doing some very simple little one kind of sentence. One. This is going to be the big one. This is going to be a big task. If you're new here, we're doing this kind of every week. We're, we're kind of taking a look at, at different, different scripture verses. We're going several weeks at a time. But this is what we're going to be looking at next. So I wanted to introduce that to you. But if you think about this great commission, most people look at verses 19 and 20 as being the main commission. But I want to highlight something. There's a word that's in there that we've talked about before. It's the word therefore. And anytime you see the word therefore, you should ask yourself the question, what is this there for? This operates as a bridge between two ideas. If we just start with verse 19, it's like, therefore, well, why? What's, what's the therefore? And what we're going to see is that verses 16 and 17 and 18 really lay kind of the groundwork for how we can understand what this commission is about. Because notice this, the 11 disciples, the 11 of Jesus' closest followers, they go to a mountain that he designated. He said, guys, I want you to meet me here. And they obeyed. They show up. And notice what they do. They worship him. That's kind of strange for a first century Jewish individual to do. But notice it says that some of them doubted. 
Now, this word doubt can also mean like they were hesitant. They hesitated a bit. They were still kind of like, we're still trying to work all of this out. And that might be where you guys are today. I don't know. But notice what Jesus says to them. He says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. This is what we're going to focus on today. What do you think of when you hear the word authority? Is that something where you're like, yeah, we're going to talk about authority today? Or are you like, oh, great. Talk about a preachy sermon. What are the things that we think about? What about all authority or an absolute authority? What are some things that come to mind? Maybe it's a boss, somebody who's a ruler, somebody who's a king, somebody who's in charge. And think about the way that we talk about authority. I'm going to give you guys some sentences that, that I've heard and I've probably said as well. But this kind of encapsulates a little bit of the way that we think about authority. Here's the first one. You're not the boss of me. You ever hear that? You're not the boss of me. The other one I like is, who died and made you king? Okay? My least favorite, the one that just kind of sends shivers down my spine, is two words. Two words. These are the worst. Make me. Oh, yeah, Janet Criddle. Oh, yeah. This, this is awful. We, we've heard this before. We've said these things before. What do we mean by authority? What does it look like to, to kind of push against authority? And what happens when authority kind of pushes back? And I, I want to take a, just a few moments and look at authority defined. What do we mean by authority? Now, generally speaking, authority is the power or right to give orders, to make decisions, and to enforce obedience. It's the right to tell others what they ought to do and the right to enforce the prescribed conduct through the use of power. And that might even be like a threat of punishment. And we talk about that kind of generally, but really the biblical concept is also the same. But when we think about biblical authority, who has the ultimate authority? There you go, God. God has the ultimate authority. But notice there's a key word in our definition here. That word is right. Who has the right? Who gives you the right? A person may have authority over you, not, not just because they're bigger or stronger. It might be positionally. Might doesn't always make right when it comes to authority. Think about this. A bully or somebody with a weapon can force you to do things, but does that mean they have the right? Not always. You know, there are some people you can, there's some like 90 year old grandmas who are like very frail, but man, they take charge over their grandkids. They have authority, even though their grandkids could knock them out. There's that stop. It's like, no, no, you don't talk to grandma that way. You, you don't say that sort of a thing. Do you all like the idea of authority? You know, most people kind of bristle a little bit when we talk about this sort of a thing. But in reality, we're all under authority in one way or another. There are different authorities that are kind of always in place. And so here's the question I have for you, and I borrowed this from my, my buddy Ben, and, and he and I kind of talk through sermons a lot, and we, we share some ideas, and, and I loved this question. What controls you right now? What controls you? What's keeping you in the seat, being quiet, listening attentively, making sure you don't fall asleep, all of those things? What is it that is controlling you? Think about this. Did you pay your taxes this year? Mm-hmm. Why? Why did you do that? Doesn't that seem crazy? Some of us, yes. Because we know the authorities that are in place. You know, when you drove here this morning, did you decide, you know what I would love to do? Especially if it was really early this morning, like in the fog. I'm going to see what driving on the left side of the road is like. And I'm going to go as fast as I can in the midst of the fog. Did anybody do that? No. There are authorities that are in place. And it's not the authority of a little stripe down the middle of the highway. I mean, think about it. It's just a piece of paint. You know, but all of us have agreed we're going to stay on the side that we're supposed to stay on because there are consequences if we don't. Think about family authorities. When a newborn baby, you know, if, if, if say like you're the third child born into a family, when that baby is born, the doctors don't go, where's the oldest sibling? He's got to take over or she's got to take over. We need somebody to raise this child. What do they do? You know, mom and dad or, or an appropriate caregiver, somebody who, who is able to have that authority. We also have social norms. There are certain authorities that are kind of unseen, that are kind of culturally based. Think about this. You all are sitting quietly. You're listening. I'm standing up here. I'm talking. Nobody has decided to jump up on a pew and go, ah! maybe you want to. I don't know. Okay? 
but you don't. Why is that? Or think about this. I love this. My, my brother Ben told me about He's like, think about this experiment, and you guys can do this. The next time you get on an elevator, especially in these COVID times, with your mask on and whatnot, get on the elevator, and if there's other people that are on there, just turn around and look at them. We, we don't do that. That's odd. That's out of, that's out of the ordinary. Why? Why, why, don't we, why don't we do other things? Why don't we go up escalators backward? Think about how, how creepy that would be. You know, you get on an escalator, just turn around and watch the people as you're going up. There are social norms. There are things that we don't do. There's natural laws. Think about this. I mean, none of us are afraid that gravity is going to just shut off all of a sudden, right? I mean, and we also can't, like, decide, I'm not going to drive in today. I'm just going to fly. I'm just going to, the law of gravity has no authority over me. Watch me fly. That doesn't happen. We all have these authorities around us. But real and absolute authority rests with God alone. The moral right to tell others how to act does not exist apart from God. He's created everything out of nothing, and this is what gives him the right. He's built into the fabric of reality what is good and right based upon who he is as the creator. This is why we read in like Psalm 24 where it says, the Lord owns the earth and all it contains. It's his. He's the owner. The world and all who live in it for he sets its foundations upon the seas and establishes it upon the ocean's currents. Psalm 100 verse 3 says, Acknowledge that the Lord is God. He made us and we belong to him. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. I hope if you're here today, you're here because you understand that there's a God who has created everything, who's put, put things into order, and we want to know him that we might know how to live best. But what gives Jesus the right to say what he says? Notice this. What does, what does, the, what does, does Jesus have to do with authority? Who does he think he is? Why should I give two rips about what this man says? And this is kind of what was even going on in Jesus' day. Because think about this. You know, the times where Jesus, Jesus is having kind of a conversation um, with, with teachers, with religious leaders, and at one point he enters into the temple and he like throws out all the money changers. He topples tables. He, he says things like, you shouldn't turn my father's house into a den of robbers. This is supposed to be a place of prayer where everybody's welcome to come in. And you know what the, the religious leaders did right after that? They come to him and they say this. This is Luke 20, verse 1. It says, now on the day that Jesus was teaching in the temple, in the temple courts, and proclaiming the gospel, the chief priests and the experts in the law with the elders came up. These are the big wigs. These are the guys who are in charge. Tell us, by what authority are you doing these things? Or, or who is it who gave you this authority? This was the question that was constantly posed at Jesus. What gives you the right? Now, something interesting happened this morning as I was preaching. My iPad decided to quit. So we're going to switch over to the, the larger model here. So give me just a second. I've got a very long password. Um, as we're moving through this, I'm going to move this a little bit out of the way because that's kind of like in your face. All right. So the question is, is who, what gives Jesus the right? Now notice this. Jesus' authority is based upon who he is. It's based upon who he is. And, and we see that there are some family connections that he has. We're going to look at some of the, the authority that, that he, you know, how he teaches and the things that he said, but also by what he did. Think about this in regards to family connections. You know, Jesus at one point is having a conversation with these religious leaders, and, and they're asking, you know, he's, he's telling them about, like, I speak what the Father tells me, I, I do what the Father has sent me to do. And they ask him, who is your father? And whenever they would ask this question, it's kind of like this question about his lineage. Like, what makes you so important? Your dad was nobody special. But what does this highlight? It highlights that these guys did not know God the Father. They didn't realize even who Jesus was talking about. That his authority was resting in his position as the son, as the one who has been sent by the father to do these things. But there's also authority in what he said. Jesus has this new way of teaching. He kind of bursts on the scene here, and, and in the midst of all of these different religious leaders, Jesus does something different. He speaks as somebody who speaks with authority, with his own authority. If you were a rabbi during Jesus' day, you studied under other rabbis. And when the time came for you to teach, you would basically quote all of these other rabbis. You would say, Rabbi Hillel says this, and this is what we must do. Or, or Gamaliel has said this, we must do what he says. Jesus does something very different. 
He comes on the scene, and, and, and the religious leaders are like, this guy has had no formal training. Why are people listening to him? And it's because he speaks as if he has authority. Not as if he does, but he speaks as one who has it. Even when he's 12 years old, he enters into the temple, and he is just blowing these guys away with the questions that he's asking. The way that he's going about like talking about God and asking these certain things. It's like, who is this guy? Think about the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus gives this sermon, another mountaintop experience. And you notice what he says at the very beginning of this? He says, I did not come to abolish the law. I came to fulfill it. Now, in our ears, if we've heard that a hundred times, it's like, yeah, let's keep moving. There's more to talk about. Think about what this man is saying. I'm not abolishing the law, but guess what? I'm making it complete. Who does that? Who has the authority to do that? And then he goes on and says things like, you have heard it said, da, 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 da. but I say unto you, da, 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 da. You know, fill in the blanks. Here's a guy who's going, wait a minute, you're taking the law. You're, this is the law of God that was given, given to Moses. This is, this is what we have based our life and our heritage, our tradition, everything on. And now you're saying, but I say to you? Jesus will say, say, he'll say things like, truly, truly, I say to you. He uses this, this term, this amen and amen. I'm telling you the truth. How do you get to do that? He also talks about the name of God. And we talked about this a, a couple weeks back where we talked about the I am statements. But do you remember some of the other I am statements that we talked about? At one point, Jesus says like, and he's using the covenant name of God here. And he's around these religious uh, officials. And he says, before Abraham was, I am. And they react by picking up stones to kill him. They hear what he's saying. They know that he's making himself equal to God. But do you guys know what happened when Jesus was arrested? This is a great story. I like to call Jesus' arrest like Jesus' arrest. Because in the Gospel of John, when, when all of the soldiers come to confront Jesus and, and, and they've got Judas with him, Jesus comes out to meet them. He, he kind of steps towards them. And he goes, who are you guys looking for? And they go, Jesus the Nazarene. And Jesus says the covenant name of God. I am. And immediately these guys step back and they fall to the ground. Something happens when he says God's name that we see who's really in charge here. We see who has authority over the authorities. And Jesus walks up to them again and he goes, who are you guys looking for? Jesus the Nazarene. And then he does something even crazier. The man who's being arrested starts to dictate terms. You can, I'll go with you, but let these guys go. Imagine saying that to like a group of policemen, you know, they're coming, um, you take me, but let these guys go. You don't tell the police what to do, okay? And this is what Jesus does because he has the authority. He has the authority. But Jesus also has authority based upon what he did, his own self-understanding. There are times where Jesus not only has the power to heal people, but he has the power to forgive sins. Do you remember the story where the, the lame man comes, you know, his friends bring him in, and Jesus comes to him, and, and what does he say to him? He says, son, your sins are forgiven. And everybody goes crazy. Who has the authority to forgive sins except God? And how does Jesus respond? So that you might know that the Son of Man has the authority to forgive sins, pick up your mat and go home. Pick up your mat, walk out of here. Display that I have the right to tell you your sins are forgiven. Only God can do those things. Jesus also has a discussion with Pilate. When he's before Pilate, he's, he's, he's been arrested. And Pilate says, don't you realize I have the authority to let you go? I have the authority to condemn you? Jesus goes, you don't have any authority except what comes from the Father. I, I, I'm from another kingdom. If my kingdom were part of this world, then those who, were, who would be after this would, would be setting things up differently. Jesus has a different understanding about who he is. Think about the authority that he has over nature. Do you remember the story where Jesus is in the boat and he's sleeping like a baby and a storm whips up to the point where these fishermen, these expert guys who have been out on the lake thousands of times are scared to death that they're going to die? And what do they do? Well, they wake Jesus up. Jesus, we're about to die. Don't you care? What does Jesus do? The text says he rebukes the wind and the waves. Do you guys know what a rebuke is? You know, that's a fancy term for like telling somebody, stop it. Don't do that anymore. To tell the wind and the waves, 
shut it down. And then it does. His disciples look at this and they go, what kind of man is this? That even the wind and the waves obey him. Yeah. My, my daughter was eating a, a fish sandwich yesterday, and I, I thought about this. You know, Jesus takes basically what's a happy meal, and he feeds 5,000 people. He, he takes two small fish and some, some barley loaves, and he just starts breaking it and handing it out, breaking it and handing it out. The, the man who created everything that's necessary for bread, who created the fish, who loves a good fish sandwich, is handing this out to everybody. 5,000 plus are fed. Or think about this, turning water into wine. The God of the universe who created water and who created the grape knows exactly how to turn one into the other. This is nothing for him. But think about the spiritual authority that Jesus has. It's not just the authority over nature. He's driving out demons with a word. He comes into places, and the demons stand up, and they know exactly who he is. Son of, you know, have you come to torment us, son of the most high God? They start bartering with Jesus, like, like, please, don't torment us, but send us into these pigs. Who has the authority? Jesus comes into the temple. He, he does these acts of judgment. He's, he's drawing the, the message and the meaning of the temple to himself. He also has the authority over death. Jesus raises the dead with a word. For Lazarus, for Jairus' daughter, for, for the widow who had lost her son, even the centurion, the, the centurion who comes and says, Jesus, just say the word and, and, and my servant will be healed. You don't even have to come into my house. You know, these are moments where, where Jesus shows who's in charge. And Jesus himself says, I have the authority to lay down my life and I have the authority to take it back up again. We talked about that a couple weeks ago. Authority, 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 it all keeps popping up. This is how the followers of Jesus end up on this mountain that he designates. He says, meet me on this mountain. And they come and they worship. They're hesitant. They're, they're still trying to figure out how, how hero Israel, the Lord your God, is one. And, and how he is in the flesh. How does the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, how does this all work out? And I love how his followers begin to talk about him. I want to reread what Jimmy wrote, this, wrote uh, what he read this morning for our, our communion meditation because this is so crucial. Think about what Paul is saying when he says this to the church in Colossae. He says, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. When you look at Jesus, you're seeing the face of God. For all things in heaven and on earth were created in him. All things, whether visible or invisible, whether thrones or dominions, whether principalities or powers. If you can see it, he, he made it. If you can't see it, even the power behind all of this, it's his. All things were created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and all things were held together in him. He is the head of the body, the church. He has first place. He's the one who's in charge, as well as the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself may become first in all things. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in the Son. Do you know what that means? That's huge. We're not just dealing with a good teacher. We're not just dealing with somebody who, who, who knows a good way to live life, a good philosophy to align yourself with. And beyond this, it says, and through him to reconcile all things to himself by making peace through the blood of his cross, through him, whether things on earth or things in heaven. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. This is how Jesus starts his last statement to his followers, these guys who are on a hillside, still kind of scared to death. And he says, remember who's in charge. Jesus isn't just another voice in the many. He's not, he's not an authority. He's the authority. He's the one who's in charge. And the last thing that we see is that Jesus' authority is the place for both morally and mission, the missionally concept of what we're called to do. He's the authority in how we live as well as what we do. It's, it's the fact that he is shaping who we are. He's the one who has the right to say, this is how life is meant to be lived, and here's what I need you to do while you're living that life. He's the one who has that final say. And I think what this leaves us with is another word that we don't like. Because if we're honest, we like authority. We really do. We do in a lot. We like good authority. What we don't like is the word submission. Nobody likes to submit. Let me ask you this. Who's the smartest individual in a family? The one who knows everything? 
The one who, if you would just let them do what they want to do, things would run smoothly. That's right. It's the 16-year-old. Yeah. Now, I, I'm, I'm just kidding. You know, for those our, our students who are here, believe me, I know what it was like to be 16. I had those same thoughts. It's like, man, my parents are so stupid. They don't understand what life is all about. If they would just let me do X, they would see that it's okay. Here's the problem. Here's the problem. All of us want to have this autonomy. We want to be self-governed. We want to do things our way. And, and in some ways, that's not, that's not necessarily bad. But there's a problem. Can we ever truly be free from God and from God's authority? No. Ultimately, we are created beings. We are the ones who will either determine, yes, I will live life the way that it was meant to be lived, or I'm going to go my own way and forget you. How many times have we daily put off Christ? Here's something I want, I want to get straight before we go any further. And I think this is kind of the, the big, maybe this is your, your one thing. When you said yes to Christ, what were you saying yes to? We, ha we have to ask this question. When you said yes to Christ, if you're a Christian, I know that some of you may be here and you're just kind of like feeling things out. I need you to hear this too. What are you saying yes to? Sadly, many of us think we're saying yes to salvation, which is good. That's a part of what we're here to understand and, and to, to receive from God. We're here to receive a family and a fellowship. That's a great thing. But when you said yes to Jesus, you were saying yes to his lordship. A few months back, Colton preached a message where he said, you know, the center, at the center of our worship stands an idol, and that idol is salvation. Anything that gets in the place of Jesus as Lord is an idol. And so when you said yes to Jesus, you're saying yes to his lordship. You're saying yes to him being the master. You're saying yes to him being the one in charge. He's the boss. His way is the best way. He's the one who has the rule. He's the one who has the last say. And too often we've tagged Jesus onto our lives to be a part of who we are instead of deconstructing the entirety of our lives and rebuilding it around him. We want to be Christian blank, like fill in the blank. And, and if you're confused by this, if this is like, wait a minute, Todd, this sounds completely different, let me be the first to apologize to you on behalf of the church. You have to understand that coming to Jesus means he is Lord. What he says is, is firm and final. And he calls us to experience this in a way that we can go, yes, this is the very best way. The God that we said yes to is the one who's in charge. And his charge, his command, his commission to the church starts with the biggest little word that's out there. All, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. That means that there's nobody above Jesus that you can go to. You know when kids like to play the mom and dad game? My, my daughter will do this. She'll come in, she'll be like, mom says I can watch YouTube. Oh, really? Let's find out if mom said that. And it's like, oh, nuts, you know? Here's the thing. There's nobody you can go. When Jesus says, in heaven and on earth, you can't go anywhere and, and not have Jesus be the boss. You can't appeal and be like, can, can somebody make a special exemption for me? You know, is there, is there another deity that I can talk to that can, can kind of, no, there's nobody else. But realize that this authority that rests in Christ actually gives us freedom. Not to do whatever we want to do, but to rest and trust that he is the one who is at work in us. He is the one, when he says, all authority has been given to me, he's taking the pressure off. There's two ways to say this. He'd be like, yeah, he's in charge. Yeah, he's the one who has the final say. Or you can go, man, I'm glad he's in charge. I'm glad he's the one that's got the final say. I mess up all the time. But I want to trust in his authority. And Jesus commissions his church and now what a commission is, it's, it's so cool that this is what it's called. It's because it's this official charge to a person or group to perform a task under or with the authority that the person is commissioning it, that, that they give you. In other words, we operate, we do these things under Christ's authority. There's freedom in knowing that he's the one who's in charge. It's not by my power, but it's by his authority and his work. Um, I, I thought about this kind of an illustration. When I was a kid, I loved going to my cousin Dean's house. Because there was a cool thing that we got to do on the way to Dean's house. Dean lived in this, this house that, like, you went off the main road, and there was this long stretch of kind of, like, back road. 
And I remember my dad would pull off. We had this great big white conversion van. It had like the big, you know, captain's chairs that would swing around and the, the back seat would fold down and had like a little card table that you could put, you know, drinks in. And I remember my dad would pull off and be like, hey, Todd, you want to drive? And I'm like 11. I'm like, yes, I want to drive. This is awesome. And so he said, come on up here, sit on my lap. And, and, and so I would sit on his lap and he'd, be say, he'd say, Todd, I'll work the pedals, you work the wheel. Like, All right, here we go. And the whole time I got this great big wheel and I'm doing this and my dad's controlling the brake and the gas and I never realized he had like, his hands were kind of like up underneath mine, like kind of near the steering wheel. So if I started to, to divert off course, whoop, yep, we got you, we got you back, you know. I do this with my daughter now. It's so great. I don't know if my daughter's ever going to be able to drive, but she gets to drive in this parking lot and it's awesome because she's in control. This is the best thing ever. This is what it's like to operate under God's authority. He gives us the opportunity to do things in his name, the things that he would be doing, and yet he still keeps that control as long as we will yield to him. This is why that moment was so special for me to be able to sit on my dad's lap and drive this great big van that I had no right to drive, but I was with my dad. My dad had control. He was in charge. My mom was probably sweating bullets, but it was okay. We made it there every time. Jesus, is, he extends his authority over to us, and we get to operate from a place of authority. So let me give you guys just kind of three words, and you can jot these down if you want to. This is your takeaway homework for, for today. We've got to remember. We have to remember who's in charge. Everything in this earth is God's. He created it. We are his. We are his people. The second thing is we need to repent, because there are a lot of times that, that we take the wheel. We do the things the way we want them to be done. And those are times where we need to stop and go, I've got to re rearrange my thinking. But the third thing that we have to do is we have to rest. Trusting in his authority, operating from his authority, should give us rest. Not to go take a nap, but to rest that he is still in charge. Even when we mess up, he is still in charge. And so this entire series that we're going to be doing, it's going to go hand in hand with our mission here at Milford Christian Church. We are creating lifelong followers of Jesus. That's what our mission is. That's the main thing. We get to do a whole lot of other fun stuff that's good and right, and we're not going to stop doing it. But here's the main thing. Christ calls us to replicate, to be a disciple who disciples. That's why I love this term. That's why the, the focus of this entire series is disciple, because disciple is both a noun and a verb. I am someone who is following Jesus. I'm a disciple. I'm an apprentice. I'm somebody who's learning from the master. But I'm also charged with making disciples, discipling other people, helping them along the way as Christ leads us all. We're going to head into that direction, but we've got to have this understanding first, that when we submit to Christ, we're submitting to his commission we have this transition of who we are, this transition of position where, where we now rest under his lordship where he's Lord and I'm not, and he calls us to follow and create more followers. He's going to provide the guidance and the power to do everything that we need him to do. But the question we have to ask ourselves is, is this what we want? Will we say yes to Jesus as Lord? My prayer, and like I said, I want to apologize. If, 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 if we've done a poor job of this, you know, then let me first apologize and go, I don't want anybody to leave this room with, with a bad bill of goods. I want you to be saved. I want you to have this relationship with Jesus. I want you to come and to be a part of a family. But if Jesus is not Lord, you miss all of that. Jesus said that all authority is his in heaven and on earth. And he invites us to come and see what type of rule his life is like. That we can trust him. That we can place our lives in his hand and he will make something so beautiful, so right, and so worthy of his name and then we get to bear that throughout eternity. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, we thank you for the joy of this morning. And Father, even the frustrations of this morning. God, I know that many of us, even just on our way here, we, we didn't act, we didn't drive, we didn't talk like Jesus is Lord. And so we have to take a moment, myself included, to say, you are, you are Lord and I'm not. To repent, to change our mind to turn from where we've been walking and walk a different way. And God, to rest in you. Lord, I pray for those who, who may want to, 
to know you for the first time, to understand what it means to, to call you Lord and to, to offer their lives in service to you. That you will take that life, that you will, you will clean up what needs to be cleaned up. You will, as a matter of fact, you'll kill it. You'll take that life and you'll bury it, but you will raise it to new life. So God, if there are those who want that opportunity, even today, Lord, may they come running to have this new life. And, and Father, to be of service to your church, God, don't let anything get in the way especially when we want to call you Lord, to do things the right way, to represent you in a good and right way, to, to show the world that their idea of you is, is incorrect. God, you lead the way. You have all the authority. And so we're going to follow. Give us the strength, the patience, the endurance to create lifelong followers of you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Okay, let's stand together and sing.